broke the chains of disgrace Covered the dead with your grace Freely you came for all So we could be with you Remind me of who that I am Led by your spirit and truth Do what you want to do I just want to be with chains of disgrace and covered the dead with your grace freely you came for all so we could be with you remind me of who that I am led by your spirit and truth what you want to do I just want to be with you Come 
in a storm The voice that's calling me home You knew me before I was born Just wanna be with you Just want to be with you Just want to be Welcome once again uh, today to Lakelands at Home. Boy, we've moved into the month of September now. Autumn's on its way and actually you can see a, a definite difference now in the evenings. They're beginning to close in again, aren't they? And there's this kind of, I don't know if you've noticed, a soft coolness in the mornings that kind of comes as the summer begins to fade. And it's nice. One big thing is that the children are now back at school or will be very soon if they're not already. And, you know, like everything else, schools are affected by these restrictions and by the distancing and so on. But listen, I'm wondering straight away at the beginning, could we just take a moment together to begin with, to pray for our children, for all children, as they enter into this new season uh, at school? So let's pray. You know, Psalm 127 and 3 says that children, they're a gift from the Lord. And what a precious, wonderful gift they are. And Father, today we lift our children before you, Lord. And it doesn't really matter how, uh, it doesn't really matter how old they are, they're always our children. But today we're thinking of all, all those, all the children who by now will have returned to school or how who will do so very soon and lord our oh lord we ask you f f for your blessing upon them we ask that you would go with them that you would be with them that lord we would ask you to protect them to just surround them we'd ask that you'd help them help them all to adjust to whatever a classroom might look like now with everything that's going on father and Lord, we pray that none of it would interfere with their education. Lord, help them. Help them, Lord. And Father, we just take a minute now, uh, uh, as maybe you bring someone or, or some people to our minds. Lord, we just pause and we think and we allow you to do this. There may be people in need or... People who need a touch from the master's hand. Family members. Neighbours. Might even be complete strangers God can put on your heart. But Lord, we would ask that you would meet each one of them at the point of their need, whatever that might be. And Lord, as we look at your word today, we will see Jesus going and meeting someone exactly at his point of need. And we would ask that you would do it again. Do it again, Lord, for those that you have laid on our hearts and shown us. Minister to them. Bless. Heal. In Jesus' name. And now, Father, as we, as we settle to worship, as we settle to your word, Holy Spirit, we ask, come. Inhabit this space, inhabit this time. Become very real to each one of us today as we seek the face of God. Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, you have come to reveal Jesus to us. And we pray, we pray that you would reveal Jesus to us this morning. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Let's worship the Lord.
there is no one like you, there is none beside you, open up my eyes, see wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and Righteousness for me stands in my defense. Jesus, it's your blood. Your blood speaks a better word than all the empty claims I've heard upon this earth. Speak righteousness for me. Stands in my defense, Jesus, it's your blood. What can wash away our sin? What can make us whole again? Nothing but the blood. Nothing but the blood of Jesus What can wash as pure as snow Welcomed as the friend of God Nothing but your blood Nothing but your blood, King Jesus. Your blood speaks a better word than all the empty claims I've heard upon this earth. Speak righteousness for me that stands in my defense. Jesus, it's your blood. What can wash away our sin? What can make us whole again? Nothing but the blood, nothing but the blood of Jesus. 
Testifies and brings, tells of a father's heart to make a way for me. Now boldly we approach by earthly confidence. It's only by your blood. the Lord. And Father, as we look into your word now, speak to us for your glory. Amen. And amen. You know, uh, during the week that has passed, I was reading through the book of John. Not any kind of in-depth study or anything like that. I was just, just reading. And I came to this story in John chapter 5. And it's the one about the, the pool of Bethesda and the, the guy, the man who had been, had been lying there for, well, for a long time, um, hoping to get healed. And you know, it was just one of those times, and I'm sure you've experienced it. It's, it's one of those times when you're, when you're reading scripture, you know, and God kind of, he gets your attention some way. He, he puts his finger on 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 something uh, and through that he kind of he draws your heart and he draws your mind into the passage but if i'm honest actually what first uh caught my attention with this passage it wasn't really anything that you might say is super spiritual or anything like that it was just the name the mention of the name uh bethesda you see a few years ago now, uh, my wife Leslie and I, along with a, a group from North and, and the South of Ireland, we were fortunate enough to have been able to visit Israel. And part of that, part of the trip included some time in Jerusalem. And among lots of places that we visited in Jerusalem, we went to the Pool of Bethesda. Here's a Actually, I'll just show you a picture of how it looks today. It's in the it's in the old city of Jerusalem, within the walls, and actually, over the centuries, you know, as buildings have come and gone in the city, it actually seems that nothing was really ever kind of completely cleared out of the way. It seems that just old buildings were kind of just flattened. Or, or leveled out and then they were built on again you know layer upon layer upon layer and it was continually rising and that's why today 
I'm sure the pool is maybe the equivalent, it's maybe two storeys uh, below present day street level. But there you go. So, as I read the name Bethesda, as I heard this name Bethesda, I was kind of transported back in my mind then to our time there, which we absolutely loved, by the way. Good memories were kind of flooding back. All sorts of things came flooding back. But God now had my attention. And I was drawn into the story. And, <coughs> excuse me, in this instance, I could actually relate to where this happened because I'd been there. You see how God does it sometimes. So, as I read the story, uh, and I read it a few times, as, as I read it, I was just sitting quietly in his presence and I was mulling the story. I was mulling things over in my mind. You know, the, what the Bible talks about, meditating on God's word. And I seem to be drawn to one particular thing in this story. And it was the question that Jesus asked this man. And then a few different ideas or thoughts kind of around this question. They began to kind of, um, looking for the right word here, they began to form in, in, in my mind. And I want to share some reflections on this uh, this morning as I believe God I believe God wants to speak to us through it and he has a message in there for us all so let's let's read the passage first can we together and then we will get into it it's John John chapter 5 beginning at verse 1 afterward Jesus returned to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish holy days Inside the city near the Sheep Gate was the Pool of Bethesda with five covered porches. Crowds of sick people, blind, lame or paralysed, lay on the porches. One of the men lying there had been sick for 38 years. When Jesus saw him and knew he had been ill for a long time, he asked him, Would you like to get well? I can't, sir, the sick man said. For I have no one to put me into the pool when the water bubbles up. Someone or someone else, sorry, always gets there ahead of me. Jesus told him, Stand up, pick up your mat and walk. Instantly the man was healed. He rolled up his sleeping mat and began walking. Just a little bit of uh, of context here. The the Pool of Bethesda, it was one of a number of pools, I'm not, I can't even remember how many there were, but they were either in or they were around the, the city of Jerusalem. And in ancient times, the Pool of Bethesda was used to provide water for the nearby temple. And the name Bethesda, it's a name, it, well, it's a name that's made up of two words, uh, Beit or Beth, meaning house, and Chesed, meaning mercy or goodness or, or favour. So Bethesda is, is house of mercy or house of goodness or house of favour. And there was this belief, there was this kind of superstition uh, surrounding the pool that at, at certain times an angel would come down and would stir the waters. And then the, the first person, the, the first buddy who managed to get into the water after that they'd be healed of whatever sickness or whatever ailment it was they had at the time but you know the bible doesn't teach that this is what actually happened it just kind of tells us it informs us that there was this widely held belief at the time and that's why you know we read in verse 3 that is when jesus came to the pool there were crowds of sick people, blind and lame and, or, or paralyzed. And they were all <coughs> all around the pool. They were all lying around the pool. They were lying on these porches, maybe because they could get some shade or whatever. But every one of them was hoping to get healed. And you know, there must have been some sort of sad, pitiful, frantic scramble. Whenever they, whenever they actually thought that the waters had been stirred. Can, can you picture it? 
because it had been all trying to get in first to get healed crawling over each other fighting biting or whatever just to get in there just to get in there first with the hope that they might be healed and I you know I was thinking isn't it great to know that we're not in competition with each other for the attention and for the affections of Jesus we're all loved equally and we all have the very same opportunity and access to him as children of God. So Jesus comes to the pool and out of all the crowd, out of all, all the people that were there, young, old, uh, men, women, I don't know, maybe boys and girls too, I, I don't know, it doesn't say. But out of all of them, Jesus approaches this one man. I wonder why he chose him. We don't really know. Uh, yes, he knew that he was sick for a long time. But that's that's a question that I would sometimes ask God for myself. When he came to me, why me? Why did you come to me? Why did you choose me among the many? Do you ever ask yourself that question? You know, For me, I don't know the answer to that. I really don't. I just know that he did. And I will be eternal, eternally grateful that he did. He chose me. And he chose you. So Jesus chose this man. He approaches him. And I, I suppose some might say it was his lucky day. Because it was his day to encounter Jesus, wasn't it? It was his lucky day because he was about to be set free from the, from the sickness that he had. It was his lucky day because, well, it was the day that he got a brand new start, a, a new life, a new go at life anyway. And you know, that's the story of every child of God, of God today who has encountered Jesus in, in getting saved. So Jesus asks the question, would you like to get well? Or maybe it depends, I suppose, on your translation. It, it might say, do you want to be healed? And you know, this is where ideas and thoughts around this began to form in, in my mind. And the first and maybe the main thought today uh, was this. This man needed to respond to Jesus in order to receive his miracle. I, I, I don't know, we can't say for sure, but what do you think might have happened if this man had ignored Jesus? Or for whatever reason, he, he didn't respond think what do you think might have happened do you know I'm gonna guess nothing absolutely nothing would have happened well nothing would have happened to this man maybe at least and he could have missed this life-changing encounter his opportunity to be ill to be made well again and maybe, you know, just maybe, he would have ended up lying there where he was, watching on from the sidelines while somebody else who did respond was healed and he wasn't. So now I'm asking myself the question, you know, could it be, is it possible that somehow I have missed out on some miracle or some blessing from God because I didn't respond. Do you know that thought then was immediately clashing with this whole idea uh, or concept that surely God gives out his blessings abundantly and freely to all who, who follow him. And well, actually the answer is both yes and no. The blessings and favour of God throughout the ages are freely, abundantly and wonderfully given. They're there. They're there to be had. They're available. But you know, as we look at the Bible, through the Old Testament, through into the, the, the New Testament, we will see that there is a recurring principle when it comes to blessings from God. And it's this. The need to respond in some way. Yes, God's blessings are given abundantly and freely to those 
who follow him, but they are appropriated. They are released into our lives by a response, by obedience. And I know, I wonder, do we miss this sometimes? And missing it, we maybe then end up like it could have been for, for that guy at the pool of Bethesda. We end up watching on while others are healed. We end up watching on while others seem to be blessed and blessed and blessed by God. We end up, uh, I suppose, watching on while others seem to wallow in miraculous provision, intervention from God. Do you know, we've already seen that a response was required with this man. If we look at, for example, Psalm 37 and 4, it says, Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. The blessing of God, you know, giving you the desires of your heart. It's there. God wants you and me to have it, to know it, to experience it. But how is it released into our lives? It's released by the response of delighting ourselves in the Lord. And delighting ourselves in the Lord means that our hearts find complete fulfilment in him and him alone. And if we truly find our, our fulfilment and worth in Christ, God tells us that he will give us the desires of our heart. You see, when we delight ourselves in him and in his ways, his thoughts become our thoughts. And crucially, his desires become our desires and they will never be unfulfilled. In Matthew 6, Jesus spends some time teaching about worry and about how to avoid it. He talks about food and clothing and so on. But he says in verse 31, don't worry about these things. Why? Verse 32, because your heavenly father already knows all your needs. So God's promising to meet our needs. Not wants, by the way, but needs. Big difference. But notice once again, there is a response required to release this blessing. What is it? Verse 33. My word, seek first and foremost and above all else the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And if and when we respond in this way, all these necessities in life will be met. How about Ephesians 6, 1 and 2? Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for that is right. Honour your father and the mother. This is the first commandment with a promise. What is the promise? What is the blessing that God wants to give out? Verse 3. That it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land. Now, how is that blessing released? It's released by honouring your mother and your father. A response is required. I don't know about you, but... I absolutely love to read or to hear uh, stories about God's miraculous provision and intervention wherever it might be throughout the years and whatnot. And it, it kind of just blows my mind how and when and how, just how God does this. And listen, I've been on both the receiving end of this and I have also been uh, privileged and I've been blessed to be part of someone else's miracle. For example, how about George Mueller? The guy with the orphanage, with the 300 uh, plus children. And the, the, ch the kids were prepared to go to school. But there was no food for them to eat. There was nothing to feed them with. And George Miller asked the, he asked the children to go into the dining room and to wait, believing that God would supply. And you know, before long there were several knocks on the door. There was a, a baker who, who had sensed God telling him to bake bread for the orphanage. There was a, a milk man. His cart had broken down and the milk, he knew the milk was going to spoil before, before he was going to be able to get the thing repaired, to get the wheel fixed. So he came and he asked George if he could, could you use some free milk? 
you know, God's miraculous provision. And the children were fed. But why did George Mueller experience these blessings? Money more than them, by the way. It was because he obeyed God. This didn't come out of the blue. Because when God burdened uh, him for the children, the destitute children, he responded with a yes. And not not just a yes in, in word, but also a yes indeed by what he did, his actions. And the blessing and the provision was there. But it was released by response, by obedience. You know, I think sometimes we maybe hear of stories like this where God just seems to miraculously supply, and I'll use that phrase, out of the blue, as it were. And we can easily fall into the trap of sitting and waiting on God's provision. But you know, if you delve just a little deeper into these stories, in fact, I know that I could easily challenge any one of you now. Point us. Point me, point you, point us to any story you want of God's miraculous provision. And together we will find a response or obedience that released this blessing. Every single time. Every single time. You know, in a nutshell, if we want to experience the abundant life God has for us all. And that includes all the blessings. That includes all the miraculous provision and intervention, then we need to respond and obey by living and walking and moving and ministering in the life that God has called us to. You know, recently I read a a Facebook post, which I think kind of captures this really well. Um, The post said something, something like this. It said, God did not cause the manna to fall into the mouths of the children of Israel. But he did place it within reach. And you know, so many great, so many wonderful blessings uh, from God. And I'm not just talking about, um, uh, in fact, I'm not even primarily talking about material goods here. or material blessings, though they are certainly part of this. But there are so many blessings from God already given. Look look at Ephesians 1 and 3, for example. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Now, first of all, it's every, all, every spiritual blessing that it is possible to give us has been given. And secondly, it's, it's has, it's past tense, it's a done deal. These blessings exist, they are already there. And you know what's more, they're already yours if you are a child of God. Your name is on the parcel, as it were. And he has placed them within your reach, within your grasp. If only we would reach out and respond in obedience and fully live the lives that we're called to. You know, the children of Israel had to actually work to receive the blessing of manna. They had to go out and gather it. If they had sat in their tents waiting for it to fall into their laps without responding, well then they would have missed their miracle And they would have been hungry. I hope we're beginning to see this need of a response, guys. They responded and they were blessed. And in in, in their case, it it meant they were being fed. They were fed. Now, in our passage, you know, that we read this morning, this man responded with, I suppose, what was basically, well, my words. He's kind of said to Jesus, yeah, of course. I want to get healed. Well, kind of, why do you think I'm lying here at the side of the pool? That's kind of what he said. But he received his blessing. Verses 8 and 9. Stand up, pick up your mat and walk. Instantly the man was healed. 
You know, this is such an important and I believe a timely prophetic word for us all today. The times and seasons that we find ourselves in today, they're strange times. They're different times. Everything that can be shaken has been shaken over this last few months and that includes the church. <clears throat> the church has been shaken too. And I believe I believe that God has shown his church. First of all, he's shown us what is truly important to him. And I believe God has provided us with an opportunity for, uh, you, you could say, a reboot. Not into something new, by the way. In fact, quite the opposite. Into something more ancient than the kind of Western church traditions of the last <coughs> excuse me, few centuries. Where we had this calamitous separation between clergy and laity. You know, we ended up with just a few people up front. Uh, ministering and somehow somehow the church seemed to lose or mislay the last part of the great commission that was given to us all by Jesus Matthew 28 verses 19 and 20 go therefore and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and this is the key part Teaching them to observe or obey all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. And rather than learning to obey, we learn to gather and to store and to build up knowledge and information. And we made many, many, many converts, but not so many disciples and it is the disciples those who respond and obey it's them who who walk and live and breathe in the miraculous we now have an opportunity to return not back to church as normal but back beyond that to discipleship and to the church that Jesus created and is still building how, how will we respond to this? Will we, will we grasp this? Will we seize this opportunity that God has given us? Or will we go back? Will we sit in our tents and wait once again? The choice is ours. Listen, so let me close by pointing you to a few different places all over the world where the church is flourishing. <clears throat> places like India, China. Iran, Honduras, many other places, traditionally difficult and hard places. But if you take time to look and to examine, and listen, I would strongly encourage you to take time uh, to look at these churches if you can. If you dig a little into what's happening very soon, you're going to see that the reason they are flourishing, and they are, is that they have chosen to be obedient they are not creating converts filled with knowledge. They are making disciples who obey. Disciples who make disciples who make disciples. And they are seeing, they are living and experiencing God in ways that many of us have long since forgotten. Can I say to you today, you know, that I feel deeply burdened and troubled for much of the church today. I'm afraid that it's going to miss this opportunity of encounter with the living God. Like this man at Bethesda. Will we respond and be healed from all that has paralysed us in the past? Will we respond and experience the miraculous? Do you know if we don't, at best we're going to end up watching from the sidelines while others flow in the blessings of God. But at worst, we will be the church at Ephesus mentioned in Revelation chapter 2. A church that had started off well. A church that, for example, could spot a, could spot a false teacher at a, a, a thousand metres on a dark night in a thick fog. But at its core, 
It was a church that had lost its passion and its purpose. And Jesus had issue with it. He told them to return to their first love. He told them to do, to do the works that they did at first. And they were clearly warned if they didn't, then he, Jesus, would remove the lampstand from them. Effectively, Jesus would leave the building. And they would lose their identity as a church completely. And you know, that for me is a scary thought indeed. And it's one that should shake us and stir us and really cause us to seek God. Let's respond. Let's be obedient. Let's be disciples. Amen. Thank you.